Good morning and welcome, Crossview family. I invite you to stand and prepare our hearts as uh, we sing to our good God, who is faithful to meet us here and fill this place. Come on. Jesus is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. As we worship, let's focus our hearts on Jesus, the precious cornerstone of our faith.
We ask you to remove the ground that we stand on and place our feet on a sure foundation. Would our trust not be misplaced on sinking sand, but in Jesus' name. Prepare our hearts for your word now and for your spirit to move and awaken and refine us. Lord, would your grace also pour over our brokenness this morning and would we lift our eyes back to you for our healing. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, Crossview Church. We are so glad you're here with us, whether you're online or in person. If you call Crossview Church your home, please continue to give so the ministry that is here in Wisconsin Rapids can continue. And you can do that either online, in the app, or on the back blo black boxes on the back wall. But if this is your first time visiting with us, we're so glad you're here. And please stop by the Welcome Center as we have a gift for you. Now, I only have a few announcements, the first one being that today, after this service in Classroom B, I will actually be having a meeting for anybody that would like to volunteer for kids' ministry this fall. I want to get that started, and I want to do it soon. So I need many volunteers, and I'd love to be able to talk to you and give you an update on what is going on for children's ministry. Our second announcement is for the APEC students, and this is for students entering 6th grade through 12th grade. APEX is having an annual boating day on Wednesday the 25th from 3 to 7 p.m., and you can check the website, the app, or APEX social media for more details. Now I'm going to invite Pastor Dan DeRoshi up, and we're going to have a child dedication. Thank you, Trevor. We have the joy this morning of dedicating a child to the Lord. And so Alea Mae Stevens is going to be dedicated to the Lord. So I invite her up with her mom, Jada, and her grandma, Julie. And as they come up, I want to explain what they're doing and why they're doing it. Child dedication is a way of presenting Alea to the Lord for his blessing. Uh, it's also dedicating uh, Jada and Julie to the godly task of um, parenting. And also, it seeks uh, dedication as a marker that seeks the help and prayers of the church in this family's life. And so we're excited to have them and to be doing this. Here's Alea. Alea is wearing the same dress that her mom was dedicated in, so how special is that? The verse I have for Alea uh, is John 15, verses 4 and 5. And it says, Remain in me, and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains in the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him 
produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. And my prayer for Alea is that she has a deep desire to remain in Christ, that she would have a heart that would always be turned towards Christ, and that Christ would fill her heart with his love and spiritual fruit. So as you dedicate Alea to the Lord, I'm going to ask you three questions that mark your desire to do this, and you may answer by saying, I do. Do you promise with God's help to raise Alea in the training of God's word and with the community of the church? Do you promise to pray with Alea and live out your faith before her as Christian parents, uh, a parent seeking God's will and for her life? And do you promise through the power and the grace of God to do your utmost to introduce Alea to the knowledge and the love of Jesus? Excellent. In church, I have a question for you. Do we promise before God and one another that with God's help and guidance, we'll support Jada with our prayers as she seeks to fulfill her responsibility? And do we promise to assist her by providing encouragement, counsel, prayer, and ministries to guide Alea in the ways of godliness? If so, let's answer, we do. We do. Excellent. We have some pictures of Alea up on the screen that we'll look at. And then we will dedicate her to the Lord. Let's dedicate Aaliyah to the Lord. Come here, sweetie. Hi. Well, how are you? Let's pray. Please bow your heads with me as I pray. Dear Jesus, I thank you so much for Aaliyah. I thank you for the gift that she is to this family. And God, we are filled with joy and awe to bring her before you and present her before you now. We dedicate her to you. I pray that you would place within her heart a desire to know you and want to be with you, and that she would grow close to you all of her days. I thank you for Jada and Julie, and ask your blessing be upon them as they raise her, and we thank you for the blessing that she is. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You say amen? You said there's a big light up there. Let's give her a hand. Would you stand as we continue to worship? i
nothing can pluck us from it and we can't lose you as believers and we just thank you for that security and that promise and Lord as we turn our, our, the eyes of our heart towards your word now I ask that you'd help us by your spirit to comprehend what you have for us today and to help us grow and we pray this in Jesus name amen you may be seated before I begin the sermon uh, today I just want to point something out that's kind of another Crossview uh, family moment. Uh, many of you know uh, Craig and Barb Yelly, and they don't know I'm doing this, but uh, this Sunday is Craig and Barb's last Sunday here at Crossview. They are moving to Minnesota this week, and Craig and Barb have been amazing family members of Crossview. Uh, in 2009, when this church was part of Woodlands as a multi-site, they worked really, really hard and committed from that time forward to uh, see the gospel go forward in Wisconsin Rapids through Woodlands Church. Uh, I remember Greg would transport, he's a preacher of sorts, because he would transport the sermon on DVD uh, each Sunday from Clover to here and never missed in years of doing that. And Barb's hospitality to that extended to so many to make you feel so warm and welcomed in the presence of Christ in them was just an amazing gift. And as a couple, they've just been uh, incredibly, an, an incredible encouragement and gift to our body. And so uh, would you guys please stand up so we could just acknowledge you and say thank you for all you've done for us. Let's thank them. I would like to pray for them uh, as they head out. So please bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of Craig and Barb and their family. And Lord, uh, we thank you for how you use them powerfully uh, for your glory in this life and of our church. I thank you that you uh, use them to be an example for us as far as what it means to walk with you. I thank you for the way that they loved us well and the way that we felt loved in their presence. And God, I just ask that you give them all they're going to need in this transition. We pray for grace as they move back to be uh, in your family. I ask that you would be in all the details that have to happen between now and then. Uh, I thank you for the gift of, of family and that, that now they'll be uh, closer to their uh, kids and grandkids. And I just ask that you would bless those times. And we just thank you for the gift they are and send them off with your, our deepest blessing and uh, with our hearts full of love for them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's a ministry called Open Doors that works with Christians who are persecuted around the globe. And they told us this true story in one of their recent magazines about a man who was a Muslim and became a Christian. And they gave him the name Bagus, which isn't his real name, uh, out of protection for him, but that's the name they used. And Bagus came to know Jesus in 2015. He was baptized the following year, and Bagus remembered the reason he came to Jesus. He told the reporter, it was because of my long and hard and troubled life. The reporter said, so when you finally came to follow Jesus, did all the troubles go away? He actually said, yes, they did. My life completely changed. The reporter asked, what did you do for a living then? He said, I was a trash picker. She said, what do you do for a living now? He said, I'm still a trash picker. 
But looking at all the external circumstances of his life, it would be easy to conclude that his life had not improved, at least externally. So the journalist asks him, how do you feel after making a decision to follow Jesus? He said, oh, I feel so different. I feel at peace and I feel restful. Bagus then quietly mentioned that he was a house church leader for 15 former Muslims in his village. The journalist had also discovered that Bagus' life was far from untroubled as a follower of Jesus. A villager had seen Bagus sharing the story of Jesus with a neighbor and reported him to the village authorities. The, the authorities dragged him and 15 others out to a paddy field and threatened to take their lives unless they returned to Islam. Bagus refused and remained firm in his new faith in Jesus. While his life was spared, he is now forced to live apart from his wife and children, spending days on the street, and he can only see them periodically. Even in the midst of that pain, he says, I never, ever regret my decision to follow Jesus. I have no hints of doubt. I'm following him wholeheartedly because now, for the first time, my heart is at rest. Thankfully, we live in a country where we don't experience religious persecution to the level that Bagus does. We can gather here freely, but it's important for us to remember our brothers and sisters who don't have that freedom, who are brothers and sisters nonetheless, who live in situations way beyond what we can even imagine uh, to live in as a Christian. And we might not experience persecution on that level, but there are times where we all would agree that it's not easy to be a Christian. There's times in our lives here in this setting where it's not easy to be a Christian and we can experience what it's like to go through persecution simply just by being associated with Christ. Obviously not on the same level as that, but we can experience difficulties because of faith in Jesus. And in our text today, in the story we're going to look at, the author Mark wants to show us two people who faced persecution, extreme difficult persecution, because of their faith, and they both handled it very, very differently. And he wants to have us look at these two people and observe the contrast of how they handled living in a hostile situation. How do you handle living in a culture that is hostile to Jesus Christ? If we look closely at these two individuals that we're going to see in the Bible text this morning, we're going to find a secret of how you not only live in difficulty, but how you live in a culture that's hostile to the faith in Christ. If you have a Bible, I encourage you to turn it on or open it to Mark chapter 14. I'm going to focus on verses 53 to 72. And I'm calling this sermon The Tale of Two Rocks because we're going to see two people who were referred to as rocks. We're going to see Jesus, the solid rock, and we're going to see Peter, whose name means rock, who was the broken rock. The solid rock and the broken rock. And if we look at their reactions, we find a secret that Mark wants us to grab, and I believe the Lord wants us to grab as well. So we're going to start by looking at Jesus, the solid rock. Mark chapter 14, I want to look at verses 53 to 59 to start with. They led Jesus away to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders and the scribes assembled. Peter followed him at a distance right into the high priest's courtyard. He was sitting with the servants, warming himself by the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they could not find any. For many were giving false testimony against him, and the testimonies did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days I will build another not made by hands. Yet their testimony did not agree even on this. So they took Jesus out of the Garden of Gethsemane, and they led him to the high priest's house. There was so much about this that was completely illegal and should not have happened by their standards of Jew, uh, Jewish uh, and Roman Empire law. Peter followed as they led 
Jesus down this sham of a court, but he stayed at a distance so he didn't get caught, but he wanted to see what was going on. Their quote-unquote trial was completely illegal. It broke many of the Roman Empire rules for a court case at that time. It was held at night, which, wasn't, which was illegal. It was held in secret, which was illegal, and it was held in the wrong location. It could not be held in a high priest's house. It had to be held in a public venue. Also, Jesus was not provided an advocate, which was common during court cases of that day. And also, how they went about the court case was completely wrong. In that day, you had an accusation that was founded, and then you argued for acquittal. That's how it worked back then. And they could not even get an accusation. They couldn't even agree on an accusation. They were bringing different accusations up, and they found that they couldn't get all these people to even agree on the same lie. And so this whole thing from beginning to end was kind of a judicial mess. Then someone thought they found something. They brought up this half-truth of how Jesus said he would destroy the temple, the Jerusalem temple, which is illegal to say, but he was referring to himself. They said he will destroy the temple, which is punishable by death, and then they tried to get that to go forward, but even that they couldn't find people to agree on. So this group became furious and frustrated. They wanted to see Jesus put to death, but they couldn't put anything on him that would cause that to happen. And they were growing angry, they were growing frustrated, the night was going on and on, there was things, momentum and, and emotion building, something had to move this forward, and something did. It was another illegal action. When the high priest Caiaphas spoke, he's not allowed to speak into legal hearings, but he went ahead and did this. Look at verse 60. Then the high priest stood up before them all and questioned Jesus, don't you have an answer to what these men are testifying against you? But he kept silent and did not answer. The high priest stands up and breaks the rules of law of the day and says, don't you have an answer and Jesus, in kingly, authoritative silence, does not answer. And in doing so, fulfills a prophecy that was predicted and spoken thousands of years before this moment that says this. Isaiah 53, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, like a sheep silent before her shears, he did not open his mouth. There was many prophecies from this point, as we're going to see in the book of Mark, to the time of Jesus' resurrection that were fulfilled in these chapters. And then in this moment of this crazy trial, something totally ironic and insane happens. Matthew tells us in his account of what's happening here that the high priest put Jesus under oath before God if he only knew and realized. Look at verse 61 again. But he kept silent, did not answer. Again, the high priest questioned him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. The high priest asked him two questions. He asked him, are you Messiah and are you the son of God? When he says the son of the blessed one, he's referring to God the Father. That blessed one means for God the Father. So he says, are you the Messiah and are you the son of God? Those are the two questions he asked. And Jesus did not have to give an answer. He did not owe them an answer, but he chose to do so. And he did it in an absolutely stunning and amazing way. He combined three common Old Testament passages that his audience in that kangaroo court would know that would say to them that he is not only Messiah, but he is the Son of God, and he will come again and judge. And he wrapped and wove these three common Old Testament passages that those who were questioning him would know very well, and he wove them into one common phrase and gave that to them. And in doing so, he was declaring he was both the Son of God and the Messiah who is to come. 
the three phrases we see are first one's Isaiah 52 8 it says for every eye will see when the Lord returns to Zion this is something that those who were accusing him would know so well to refer to a coming king the son of God and Messiah would come the second one was Psalm 110 1 this is a declaration of the Lord, that first Lord referring to God the Father. The Lord said to my Lord, the Son, sit at my right hand. Jesus is saying, I and the Father are one. The Father and I are one. I am God. And then the last verse that he tied into his response was from Daniel 7.13. It says, and suddenly one like the Son of Man, was coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus wove all three of these in his reply to the high priest's question, and it had to make them all shudder, because what he was saying is, I am God, I am Messiah, and you sit here and you judge me in this mock trial when you don't even realize a time is coming soon when I will be the one who will judge you. Those were his only words to his accusers in this moment. And they did not listen. In fact, they went off into a rage. Look at verses 63 and 64. It says, Then the high priest tore his robes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What is your decision? They all condemned him as deserving death. It's interesting to know that Jesus was never, ever found guilty and convicted of anything in their established court of law. He was found and placed their own made-up charge over his head that pushed him into what he was doing. He was a sinless son of God, even to the end of his earthly life. The high priest was in horror. He was really, really ticked. And he said, you've heard the blasphemy, and they condemned, and all chaos broke out in that made-up courtroom, and they condemned him to death. And one commentator says this, in utter ignorance, souls in darkness condemned their Messiah to death. There was damnation and hell in that room. And then it began. Look at verse 65. Then some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to beat him, saying, Prophesy! The temple servants also took him and slapped him. The ultimate of insults began. They began the beatings. The beatings would last well into the night. One beating after another beating after another beating after another beating. They took a cloak and they put it over his head. And they hit him in the head and said, if you're the son of God that you claim, who just hit you? And they taunt him. And without knowing it, they fulfilled another prophecy that was prophesied years before. I gave my back to those who beat me and my cheeks to those who tore out my beard. I did not hide my face from scorn and spitting. One of the proofs of the Bible, one of the proofs of the cross, one of the proofs of the resurrection is that there's over 200 prophecies that were fulfilled in Jesus going to the cross. Things that were said thousands of years before the actual event took place, but then it happened, and this is one of those. And so the guards took Jesus, and they continued the beatings all night long. It was the darkest night in human history on the earth. One of my favorite seasons in Crossview Church is Vacation Bible School, and we just had it a couple weeks ago. And there's an amazing story that came out of Vacation Bible School this year that we as a church family should take listen to and be led by a child who said this. There's a child in one of the classes who talked to their adult leader, and the child began to talk about how they saw pictures of Jesus on the cross, and they saw what they were doing to Jesus, their Savior. And I don't know if it was in a book or in a movie with their parents or what, but this child saw what was happening to Jesus the night he was crucified. 
And as this child is talking about this to their leader, all of a sudden, big, huge tears well up in her eyes. This girl was probably seven or eight years old. And the tears flow down her face as she's talking about how it affected her to watch what was happening to Jesus. May we all be captured by what our Savior did for us like that little girl was. May she lead us as a church into the awe and wonder of what our Savior did for us by going to a cross and dying and paying for the penalty for our sin. And the amazing thing is when Jesus withstood all the torture, all the horror, all the emotional, physical, and mental anguish of the cross, he never, ever cracked. The solid rock never, ever broke. The rock of our salvation delivered as promised. He said he would save the world of their sin. He would pay the penalty of our sin, and he did. How do you do that? How do you endure such persecution and not crack? The answer is in another fulfilled prophecy from Isaiah 57. It said, the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I have not been humiliated. The Lord God will help me. Jesus stood before the Sanhedrin. Jesus stood before the high priest. Jesus stood before Pilate. Jesus endured the execution of the cross and the torture beforehand because he did not rely on his human abilities, but he relied upon God alone. Yes, he was fully God, just like he's fully man, but when he endured the things fully human on this earth, he did so by relying on the power of God. I asked in the beginning, how do we stand for Jesus and the ways of God in midst of a hostile culture? The only way we do it rightly is to become dependent upon God and nothing within ourselves. Jesus was modeling this. He was the perfect example of how to live out the Christian faith in an extremely hostile culture. And he accomplished his mission through the power of God alone. And now Mark wants us to notice something else. The purpose Mark puts this story right before the next is he wants us to see this contrast between how Jesus, the solid rock, handled this and how Peter, the broken rock, handled it. He wants us to take notice of the two different things. That's why he puts them right next to each other. Look at verses 66 to 71. It says, While Peter was in the courtyard below, one of the high priest's maidservants came. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you are talking about. Then he went out to the entryway, and a rooster crowed. When the maidservant saw him again, she began to tell those standing nearby, this man is one of them. But again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing there said to Peter again, you certainly are one of them since you are also a Galilean. Then he started to curse and swear, I don't know this man you are talking about. In the midst of this horrible night, when Peter pledged that no matter what happens, God, I will never, ever leave you. Not only did he lie, and he denied ever knowing him, but after the third denial, he ended up cursing against himself, which was a serious charge in that culture. He was so denying the fact he was with Jesus, it was like he was denying his identity of everything Jesus said about him and, and placed upon him in the, minute, the three years before. And Mark wanted us to see and know that in the heart of Peter, this was totally intentional. This was a decision he made that was intentional. 
It wasn't something that just slipped out. Peter was afraid of the persecution to come. He didn't want to endure it. And so he, in that moment, denied him three times. And Peter did not realize that while this was happening, while this denial was going on, Jesus' kangaroo court finished, and they were bringing him out. And Luke, as he tells the story, captures something else, that as Jesus is being let out, his eyes caught with Peter. And it says, then the Lord turned and looked at Peter, so Peter remembered. Peter looked at the torn, broken, bleeding man that he called king and vowed that he would never, ever deny or ever, ever leave. And in that moment, his utter failure, his utter brokenness, his epic fall had to crush his heart inside. Their eyes locked. And then we see in verse 72, it says, immediately a a rooster crowed a second time, And Peter remembered when Jesus had spoken the word to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And it says, and he broke down and wept. Or as the English Bible translator William Tyndale said, he wept bitterly. Bitterly. That isn't a tear coming down the cheek, holding back. That's not even an all-out sob. That's a sob that cuts to the heart, that doesn't know if you're ever going to go on because he so felt the brokenness of his denial of his Savior and his King that he knew in his heart and his mind he would never, ever leave or betray, but it happened. And he didn't know how to fix it. And the rooster crowed for three to five minutes over and over and over like a proverbial knife being stuck into his heart as he remembered Jesus' words about his denial. Now, thankfully, his brokenness doesn't end there. In his brokenness, it produced a humility that Jesus would later restore and Peter would live a more humble life relying on the power of the Spirit. However, in this night, in this moment, that was not the case. So what can we learn from this tale of two rocks? These were two human beings who were pushed to their limit. And one stood and one fell. And what can we learn about what makes one stand and what makes one fall. That's what Mark and the Holy Spirit, I believe, would want us to walk away from this. And what the difference between the two is, is that one placed their dependence upon God and the other placed their dependence upon themselves. One placed their dependence upon God and one placed their dependence upon themselves. Peter in this moment was self-reliant. Peter in this moment was self-dependent. In the days leading up to this moment, no disciple spoke out of turn as much as Peter. No disciple was reproved by God, Jesus Christ, as much as Peter. He was the only disciple that thought he had the authority to reprove Jesus Christ. He was prideful. He was arrogant. He was doing things himself, self-reliant, self-dependent, in his own strength, in his own will. When he came to Jesus and started to follow him, that was his natural default. And in this week leading up to this point, we see he did anything but submit that to God and humble himself in a brokenness of spirit and heart, acknowledging that Jesus is God. He said, yes, I will never, ever deny you. But he said that out of all of his selfish reliance and self-promotion. Jesus, on the other hand, knew that when human beings are even at their best, apart from him, they can do nothing. Jesus modeled and lived in utter dependence upon God. It's an amazing study. If you look at Luke chapter 4, 
And you look at verse 1, verse 14, and verse 18 of Luke chapter 4. You see the words where it says, Jesus being led by the Spirit. Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus in the Holy Spirit. Jesus, the Son of God, was dependent upon God the Father and modeled and walked that out. And he remained the solid rock. And Mark wants us to see the difference of the two ways to live. One, in human strength, which at best will fail. And the second, moment by moment, dependence upon God. How do we live in a hostile culture to Christianity? How do we live in a difficult time? Moment by moment, dependence on God. We don't think we're so clever that we can outwit what they're throwing at us. We don't think in our own strength we can push this back. It's moment by moment, dependence upon God. The follower of Jesus is not called to be strong. The follower of Jesus is called to be weak so that Jesus can be strong within you. We look at weakness as a bad thing. It's something we've got to get rid of. We get rid of weakness so we can be strong. I remember an ad for the Marines that said, pain is weakness leaving the body. Get rid of all weakness. We can't be weak. We have to be strong. That is not the case when it comes to following Jesus Christ. When it comes to following Jesus Christ and living the life to the point where you hear, well done, good and faithful servant, the secret is to be weak before him. Because when you are weak, you are not dependent and prideful upon yourself in pride and arrogance, but you are humbly submitted and dependent upon Jesus Christ. Weakness, when it comes to following Jesus, is not a liability. It's not a bad thing. It's a treasure. Because you learn how to live with the power of Christ living within you. In 2008, I was preaching at Woodlands Church in Plover on a passage in Jeremiah. And Jeremiah talks often about this concept about how the follower of God is called to a life of weakness before God so that God can empower them to be strong. And there was a friend of mine who was in the congregation who was a professor at University of Stevens Point, and he was a chemistry professor, an extremely, extremely talented man. He has a PhD from Duke. He wrote chemistry and biochemistry textbooks. He taught there for years, and he, he was diagnosed with brain cancer. And about eight months into his brain cancer, he was sitting in the crowd as I gave this sermon on Jeremiah and talked about the power of weakness in the Christian's life. And he wrote me this three days after that sermon on May 28th of 2008, and he went home to be with the Lord about a year later. And he wrote this after being in that position of a chemistry professor at a university and teaching really intense Bible studies in the church, classes on tough questions. He was one of those guys when somebody had a tough question about the faith, you went to him, and he would give this answer that was just mind-boggling. And after hearing that message in 2008, he wrote this, I feel so very weak and confused most of the time, and I wonder if there's a place for me in the church. If I'm honest, I let myself sink into self-pity multiple times. But this morning... The reminder from God's word that our strengths can actually be a threat and liabilities and fulfilling God's purposes spoke to my soul. And I want you to know it was well taken. The Apostle Paul said it best this way. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is perfected in weakness Therefore, I most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weaknesses. I take pleasure in insults. I take pleasure in hardships. I take pleasure in persecutions and difficulties. Why? For the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, that is when I'm strong.
Have you felt weak lately? Have you been in a place where you feel like, I don't know if I can take any more? Have you been in a place where you feel like if one more thing happens, I am at the end of my rope and I'm afraid what is going to happen? Maybe you are exactly where God wants you. Maybe in your weakness, maybe in this threat of knowing how am I going to get through, that is the exact place God calls his children and his disciples so that we run to him with broken, weak hearts, not knowing what we can do at the end of ourselves, at the end of our intellect, at the end of our talents, at the end of our strength. And we say, God, if you do not come through, I don't know what I'm going to do. Because many of you in here have stories where you know you face things in this life you can't handle in your own strength. God's children cannot handle the persecution and trials that await in this life in their own strength. They need him. We are called to be weak so that he can be strong. That's how we stand before a hostile culture. That's how we stand before a difficult trial. How do we apply this tale of two rocks? Just one phrase, with all weakness, fall into the arms of Jesus and stay there. With all weakness, fall into the arms of your Savior Jesus and never ever leave that dependent place. May that be the marker of our lives as we walk through this world as faithful followers of him. Let's pray. Jesus, I ask that you would meet us today in the places where we find ourselves. And God, I pray that in a world where we've been drilled that strength and power is how we are to live in that of ourselves, will you transform our hearts to be people of weakness, people who would be dependent upon you, people who wouldn't be self-promoting or self-reliant or self-dependent, but people would be humble, that our hearts would understand and truly recognize that apart from you, we can do nothing. God, will you meet us in that place of brokenness? Will you meet us in that place of weakness? Will you meet us in that place of humility so that we would experience what it's like to live in the power of God through us. Not us, but the power of God flowing, carrying, drawing, pulling us through what we experience in today's life. We ask that you would help that to happen by your grace, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand.
a shepherd who is an expert at specializing in the place of hopelessness and brokenness to bring, drink, to bring joy, peace, and hope. Take this blessing from Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Live in that power this week and have a blessed week. Thanks for being here.